You say hello. No. So hello and welcome to the GA Teach Meet coming um, to you from West Sussex uh, where the sun's just come out and the sun has um, come back out and the rain has stopped. Um, hopefully um, this has gone out live on YouTube and you're finding us from wherever you are. Um, we are on a little bit of a delay between what I'm saying and, and Zoom and um, the uh, YouTube uh, channel but uh, the chat in YouTube is open and also there's the hashtag there that you can um, get in touch we've got um, the range of speakers and we've got dogs children all sorts of things coming for you if you saw a little bit of a warning um, it's just so I've set the um, the rating is 18 plus so um, you know it'd be nice to have the pupils um, there so anyway this event started in uh, 2015 in Manchester um, this is the sixth and the first online um, and it's really really uh, great to, to meet you all and we've got a fantastic uh, lineup and hopefully everything will work we'll see what happens I've never done this before um, put it in the comments and uh, I'm taking some tips from my uh, my 10 year old son just to let you know uh, during this, I was contacted by uh, the brilliant Mags. Uh, Mags is doing her PhD all about teach meets. Um, and that means that she is really interested in hours and having a look at hours. So I'm just going to pause there so you can have a quick read through what I've put on screen. No one will be identified, no, um, uh, no sort of names used, etc. TeachMeet colleagues, my name is Alex Hammond, I'm researching TeachMeet for my PhD and with David's blessing I will be joining the enthusiastic lurkers as an observer this evening, thank you. So it's really good to have um, Mags on board and as I say she's there in the background uh, taking a look at everything. Um, and I hope uh, you're all sort of hearing uh, what is going on. To move on to some business, really, really thank you. Um, it's strange uh, times. Uh, this little man um, doesn't live with me and I haven't seen him for three weeks. So unlikely to see him for another three. And what we do is really important. And just to flip things on the side to get them out of the way, I just want to say thank you. Uh, thank you to the 14 uh, storytellers who have submitted uh, and I've been quite strict with in terms of time-ish. Um, Harriet and the team at the GA forever supportive of this event 
and really, really handy. Um, Dan and the team at Discover the World Education really um, sort of in some tough times themselves and they've been fantastic stepping up um, and sponsoring this event and they've been with us right from the first one. Um, Leah, who's at Leah Moo, who is behind me, um, somewhere she is uh, looking at the YouTube comments and also the Twitter feed and um, you the audience hopefully you've got a favorite beverage you've got some snacks um, who knows what's going to happen do comment and um, if you're expecting these sort of things on this channel it's really only a long short drift video and this event to talk about some logistics um, just to go over, um, there'll be a little sort of pause every now and again when we switch between. Do share using the hashtag. Um, do bring your own snacks and drinks um, and, uh, you know, do put on your YouTube comments. Um, there were 572 signed up um, for this, hence it's on uh, YouTube and not through Zoom because we didn't really want to break that. And um, it would have been quite interesting with, with less interactivity on YouTube. You'll just be able to hear uh, Triven, uh, the dog, if we bring along um, sort of Triven. So here he is. Um, he will just be um, in the background kind of uh, doing his thing. Yeah. So. We've got an amazing lineup uh, for you this evening. Um, normally, this is in a big hall. There's about uh, 200 of us, um, and we're all chatting, uh, and we're all sort of uh, nervous energy and really getting to know each other. Um, with the exception of Alan, who I've put up first, um, and when he gives that message, um, hopefully that'd be self-explanatory. But everyone else I've put on a random um, generator, and it's in a random order, although it isn't truly random on the night um, because of the logistics um, of this. And I'm aware that my screen uh, cursor is moving around, so I shall try and keep that as still as I can. In terms of the GA, the GA's um, charitable mission, if you like, is to further geographical knowledge and understanding. And I'm really pleased that um, our <laughs> chief exec, Alan Kinder, uh, was able to send us a little message. Hi, everyone. The GA was formed by a group of teachers who wanted to share ideas and learn from each other. <clears throat> that was 1893. Today, the GA has more than 7,500 members. Yes, the technology's changed, but the aim's just the same. So enjoy the teach meet tonight. Thanks to everyone for attending. Thanks to David for organizing it, for Discover the World Education for their sponsorship. Good luck, enjoy, carry on sharing, carry on learning from each other. Uh, and that's a great message there um, from Alan. And as I say, do put um, your chats in there. We've got um, people um, from all over the world as well. Switzerland, I can see there. Um, and uh, as I say, uh, and Bangkok we've just had. So, uh, Rue, so good morning there. Um, sorry for confusion about the links. Um, it all seems to be uh, going fairly well now. Um, also, massive, massive thanks to Discover the World. And um, they've been with us right the way from 2015. Um, yes, I, I do uh, some teacher tour leading for them. I've written some um, resources for them. And in fact, 10 years ago, I wrote about that Icelandic eruption, um, which where did that time go? Um, and um, I've also used them uh, for my own trips with my own schools. Um, they're absolutely great and have been with us um, all of the time and behind us um, here as well. To tell you a little bit about them, they're a strategic partner of the GA and their mission is right there. And what I've really noticed in the past um, sort of three or four years and certainly uh, by putting together my first um, Iceland trip in my new school, um, this is a real thread uh, that wasn't there before um, and it is about making that geography accessible um, to everybody. Um, 98 percent of schools rate them as good and excellent and I think you know for my own value um, it's that value for money they, they might not be the cheapest on the market but they certainly provide um, the best and um, what I really like about them which attracted me to them in the first place is their free um, resources that are all online it's a simple registration you can get in there and you can access all of that information Just before I kind of go too far, I'm just going to, I suppose, um, use the privilege of, of this just to say, you know, the conference theme of geography really matters. Geography really does matter. Um, you're going to see presentations here that you should be able to use ideas, um, simple, effective in the classroom tomorrow. 
Now, we're not going to do that this time because obviously tomorrow's Saturday and there's a few other things happening in the world at the moment. However, uh, the top points there are the aims of geography that we came up with um, when I was a head of geography back in 2008. And I don't think they've changed. Um, and also geography is that powerful knowledge. And hopefully I haven't done young a disservice, um, but it's about giving young people the knowledge that can only be got through the classroom and not picked up through everyday common sense experience. It's giving those learners a language for engaging in the political, moral and other kinds of debates. And surely there's gonna be a lot more of those after these times here. Finally, what would be also be great is um, uh, a good friend of mine, sort of Ollie Bray, uh, uh, was putting together this Give COVID the Boot. Um, so also to embarrass my uh, my geography uh, colleagues, uh, we're missing our curry yesterday. We're missing the beer meat uh, later on. But it'd be great if we could get some Give uh, COVID the boot uh, little videos during this, posting them on, up online using uh, the hashtag. So this is our um, effort. Thanks to Alan for putting this together. So if you fancy the challenge, it'd be absolutely brilliant if you've got your um, videos up there. Um, so now really, um, I need to be um, quiet and, and we're here to what you're really here for, which is to um, find out and hear from all of the speakers. Um, and it's a real great pleasure to have Alan kick off. Um, his work on the panel yesterday, I thought was spot on. Um, he's a head of geography at um, King's Ely Junior. He's the junior vice president of the Geographical Association. He's an author and geography consultant. Um, and here he is with PC Geographies. Hello, I'm Alan Parkinson. And I talk to you briefly about PC geographies, not politically correct geographies, but post-corona geographies, the geographies that we might teach when we go back to school, start teaching geography. Thinking has been framed by a Facebook group started by Matt Podbury, 1,200 members now. And through that, I got in touch with Paul Ganderton, an Australian educator. He shared these four models for how we might react to this particular crisis. And at the moment, we have stage three. Uh, are we going to reset the system? I think when we go back, we're going to have to rethink what we teach in geography, because quite a lot of what we teach will have changed. Globalisation, supply chains, tourism, where our food comes from, the nature of urban spaces and our interactions with each other. All of those are going to have changed, and they will take years, perhaps, to revert to how they used to be. And quite a lot of the familiar things that we have talked about Will have disappeared, will have changed. So we have to rethink what we're going to teach and potentially how we're going to teach that, the pedagogy of that. Now I've shared a Google Doc here where I've put together some of my early thinking. Feel free to take a look. Um, if you want to be added, then drop me an email. I don't be via Twitter, DM, geoblogs. And of course, this particular current challenge is a small one, you could argue, compared to our next biggest challenge, climate change. Are we getting together enough as a global community to tackle this challenge, which is going to prepare us to be able to do that? And finally, I'd like to give you something to look forward to, which is the next face-to-face -face GA conference. Same venue as it would have been this year. The theme is Compassionate Geographies, put together by Susan Pike. It's on 8th to 10th of April, 2021. Stay safe. And I shall see you there. Thank you very much, Alan. And I think really um, you can see why we put that one up first. And I think it really uh, gives us a lens to consider all the other geography that we've uh, considered over the last two days and what comes today. Now, don't worry, all these links um, and the presentations will be available. I'll make them um, in the video description afterwards. Um, do keep your um, comments coming. Hopefully you can hear everything loud and clear. As I say, very much an amateur at this. Um, and as I say, my son um, and his YouTube sort of uh, selection celebrities um, you know do this much better um, so now we move on to Jen Monk who uh, was in uh, and is in the zoom and um, taking a walk I think with her little one which is fantastic to see and um, 
Jen sent in a presentation. She's a head of geography. She's an AQA examiner for paper three, a co-founder of um, Jog Chat and an RGS um, excellent award uh, winner of 2019. And she's here to speak about uh, mastery and retention in geography. Well, I'll just share some of the way, the way you can So, very briefly, the benefits of using machine for practice and training and mastery. These are the benefits, really, that we found, particularly when we're trying to look at new model challenge, so we put in a lesson. We found that retrieval practice is a really good way of increasing the challenge because you can really easily vary it and also edit and change how you do things on the spot based on what the students know. I feel like you could just read that to be to tell me you want to see more. Um, so this is the one of the strategies that um, we've done recently. Obviously, just a great list of pictures, images, photographs. Photographs are the ones that we can use in life. And we've really tried this year to make corporate images when we're talking to our students and trying to recap the same symbols and signs when we are looking across topics to identify links but also just to try and really embed those key ideas. So this idea was just rather than using keywords and definitions to use images, created a real big discussion and found the students about what keywords were and what they might be and how they could be other words. And we were quite impressed really about at what this type of coverage, which was really easy to make and really easy to adapt because we've got those beautiful to adapt it just to make it a bit more useful we've also used it to recap the topics if students could annotate images to show what they know we've used it to um square as case studies so for example the one on the left was the initial grid that was given and students added to it we added barely posted those to the board um, and together we kind of worked, worked out what all of them mean and then we used them to answer an exam question on time through the hand about secondary, um, primary and secondary effects and effective responses. So we actually looked at two different exam questions using the knowledge of the words, um, but it was quite interesting to see how that changed over time. So we gave them the originally, they kind of annotated it, used their notes. And then we gave them the same grid about four weeks later. And it was interesting to see how our calls had changed. So our students always felt they were in an old pair and then it was purple. It's interesting to see that some of them remember the before, some of them remember the same, but very few of them remember the less, which was quite interesting. This is a very simple strategy. Um, again, it's quite useful to update it and again to look back over time to see knowledge students had had, how it has added, um, and to see if they've learned the same facts every time that was some of my intent to have quite useful in your was that actually they read the different responses each time to an earthquake people they hadn't really realised that they had done that much so that was quite interesting but again these are two colours is really effective mm. um, to see change and to see what they've added and what they do and do not know side of fix this came off with that and I really want to say I have it really well I can't I've looked back and I can't find if I had lots of examples of this but I can't find who the original was so I apologize if it was you but it's brilliant and uh, it's much more challenging than anything that's left to you because you're not you're actually kind of almost giving students back and then trying to work out whether they're right or wrong and sometimes I could be spelling because it could be one tiny little bit of a sentence but by the end time it's really hard compared to what you were in this and they know all of it but they found that they were really focusing on trying to make sure that they knew where the errors were and they knew how to fix them and it was quite interesting as well to get them to make their own lesson. I do know that this is one of my favourite activities but it works really well so this I use this after a long exam to look at feedback and students do really badly on the note six-month question at the bottom here 
Okay, and as I said, um, you know, it's all an adventure. Um, lots of people in lots of places juggling, um, you know, uh, families, um, being in lots of different places. Uh, we will post all of these. They will be available at the end, um, and you can contact um, everybody uh, there. Um, Leah's just behind me, and she is mapping at the moment all of uh, the 345 of you um, to, to where you are, and we'll be um, sharing those um, as well. And then... Um, Yes, the typing, we'll just uh, turn that down um, for you. Um, moving on, we have um, Ollie and uh, Ollie's presentation. Um, he's uh, going to talk to you about um, extra uh, curricular sort of geography societies. So uh, thank you, Ollie, for sending this in. And, and here we go. Just like to take a few minutes to share some ideas that we've been using in our geography club at City of London School. Um, we gathered quite a lot over the years, as you can see from the title. Uh, we have a circumstance where we need to use lunch times for our societal activities, as we're a day school and our students have very long commutes. So have a lot of an hour each way. It means that we can't really use before and after school slots and lots of other commitments mean that kids might not be able to attend every week so sporadic attendance is a bit of an issue. So we decided to try and collect a load of ideas that were fun, creative, full of geographical thinking that we could run on a standalone basis week by week so kids can drop in and out confident in the knowledge there's going to be a meeting. We found five areas of ideas work particularly well. Games were fantastic for our institution. They love competitions, anything that they can get their, their heckles up a bit over. Computer activities work really well too, especially simulations and ideas that actually put you in the on the ground in geographical scenarios. Models, arts and crafts, although we did steer clear of papier-mâché and paint time and mess requirements. 
Our jock film stock goes very well, goes on very well, lot very well attended indeed. And we always try and maintain some debates, discussions, contemporary topics that are relevant. And our younger students have got more involved with those over the years too, as we've managed to keep our attendance high. Um, we over the after a while we realised we had so many that we might put them all together. And this manual that we've created has meant that we can dip in and out and find a fun idea if we're stuck for one. Um, or we can plan for a term and think if we think put together a program of some description. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to share that later on and give you ideas or we'll give you details of how you can access that um, after this presentation too. Uh, games, just to touch on a few themes that we found work really well, were really, really good. Uh, whiteboard games we love because you could go up in squiggle, draw, get involved. And the squiggle game was a particularly good one, whereas you just draw a squiggle on a board and you turn it into a geographical scene. This particular chevron, we thought, made quite a nice mountain vista. Uh, but loads of other options have, uh, have come across our radar as well, where you can just use a pen, whiteboard, and have some fun. Uh, word association games were particularly well received too. One example from my youth, I hope I'm not showing my age too much here, mallet's mallet. So you would put a theme of someone and the word and they would have to associate that word as well. As you could say, Balwig or Step Off Slope or whatever you might be uh, interested in that particular meeting. And if you repeated a word or stuttered or got stuck in any way, uh, you may remember you used to get a bit of a, a hit on the head from Timmy Mallet here. Health and safety aside, we wouldn't do that these days. You might just prefer to give the winner a point. Um, but any parents out there will probably appreciate this. Read any activity book that your kids have on the shelf and you'll have a load of ideas for any good geography session, that's for sure. Computer challenges I alluded to, they work particularly well. This one here is a great one from the United Nations Office of Disaster and Risk Reduction, Stop Disasters, put students in the scenario of having to mitigate against a tsunami or a wildfire or something. And they put a score on it as well, so it gets the competitive element flowing. Uh, this one as well, Third World Farmer, where you have to fight the poverty trap, the poverty cycle. It's a bit dated now, but it's still a, a good thinking exercise. And there are loads of quizzes and quid map games out there that we've found over the years. Sporkle is a tried and tested favourite. Often the kids will go away and they'll come back to the next meeting and say, oh, we found this, we found this. And we spend many a good lunch out having a play around with what they've come up with over the week. Uh, our jock film store, really, really uh, popular. And we always provide free popcorn, keeps the attendance quite high. This film we've been showing for a few years and seems particularly apt at the moment. The great geographical talking points in the follow-up sessions that we've run. And we've gone to films like The Core or The Day After Tomorrow to discuss the science and to see how applicable it actually is. Loads of great docudramas out there to raise the issue. Michael Moore's done, uh, done a lot. Um, this one, Food Inc., is particularly good too. We always try and stress what's the agenda or what's the point of view. And blockbusters we've had fun with too. Uh, looking at Slumdog Millionaire, for example, Hotel Rwanda, brings lots of geographical thoughts to the fore in follow-up discussions. Recently, we've done more TED Talks, academic talks as well, and that's for the younger year groups too, just in the knowledge that they really enjoy getting involved. And as I said, popcorn keeps the attendance quite high. The spin-off of holding our regular meetings with lots and lots of different ideas. It's always known there's something on. And they always show up if they've got a spare half hour or so. We've got a really keen sixth form now. They love running sessions and getting involved too. They know that they'll have a couple of focus meetings. And we've had lots of individual projects that have come off the special skills that we've managed to recruit. We, uh, we do a job for research group every year now that the younger kids have started getting involved into, producing a magazine. We're producing a, an app on this list of ideas, actually, which I'll come to. And we've run sessions on university skills, uh, RGS lecture attendance. They've gone off to South Kensington. They've run charity lectures. And as I say, the younger kids have got involved, too, just by having this regularity. Keeping our eyes open. We've built up a, a, good, a good list, as I say, our manual, and our students are now having a look at how we can share this with uh, other people. So here's our app that's coming to market, hopefully at the end of this term or so. And we also have our website, jogsop.com. So do feel free to drop us a visit and you know, you're welcome to take any ideas you like. And if you have any yourself, please do share them. This is a collaborative process. And we're hoping to get as many ideas back as possible as well. So thank you very much for listening. Do help yourself.
Okay, thank you very much um, for that, Ollie. As I say, we're um, starting to put the map together. That's coming out. Uh, as I say, I hope um, you've got some beer. Um, if you hear the doorbell, the dog, all of that sort of thing, um, Leah and I are in, in trying to be as silent as we can here, but I can't switch uh, the audio off, otherwise you won't hear um, anything at all. Um, do keep the comments coming. They're fantastic. There are currently 340 of us um, all on here. Sorry if it's a bit rough and ready. Um, that's what a teach me is. And the idea of teach me is us sharing these simple ideas that can be used. Um, next up is Anna. Really excited um, to have Anna. Anna um, must be through one of the, the weirdest times to be an NQT. Um, she's one term in um, at prep. Uh, school. She's contributed to the implementation of Google Classrooms and it's great to actually see this um, as a story map. And as I said, we'll make the, all the links and everything um, available at the end of this. Uh, we'll put that up both on Twitter using the hashtag and we will put that into the YouTube um, description of this video as well. So keep your comments coming. Do use the hashtag. Do get in touch uh, with the speakers on Twitter. As I said, we've never done this before in this format. So keep your feedback coming uh, and hopefully it is watchable and as I say, if you hear a doorbell, it's just a beer delivery um, coming along. I am a uh, one term on NQT and I teach geography and maths at a Hertfordshire prep school. Here is my starter question for you. When you're using Google Classroom, how do you give feedback to your students? So when I started using when I started using Google Classroom, I found this really called, called a rubric. A rubric is kind of Google lingo for a kind of mark scheme. And it's a what you can do with it is create a um, assessment criteria which you can show to your students when they about to create, complete the assignment and to your students. So when I started using when I started using Google Classroom, I found this really called, called a rubric. A rubric is kind of Google lingo for a kind of mark scheme. And it's a what you can do with it is create a um, assessment criteria which you can show to your students when they about to create, complete the assignment, and then you can use it for marking. Let's go through how to do that. So you click on plus for your rubric and then you create, reuse, or import your rubric from sheets. So this means you can recycle your rubrics that you use for the same assessment objectives in a GCC six mark question as they these won't really change as you go through the types of questions. So you have your rubric here and on this there are um, criteria and titles for it. So you can name each of the levels instead of naming them one to, uh, one to two. It could be like an adequate answer, good excellent or any other titles that you, that you see fit. I have added a button here so that you can um, go through and find out more with, from Google about the what each of the title means. So in the question I used this on it was a comparison of the Japan and Haiti earthquakes uh, for my year sixes and I set a P paragraph for them to write and the structure of them I show them what I wanted them to um, how I wanted them to get out of it and then their power and their comparison of this. So, how does this then help my marking? Because here's what you might ask. Well, when they submit their work to you on Google Classroom, their rubric is on the right hand side. So, as soon as you're reading that answer, you have what your marking criteria um, is there on your right hand side. So, you just click on it and there you've marked that bit of work for that section and go through the different sections um, that you create. When the students get their work back, when you return it to them, there will be different uh, like block boxes and you've already clicked on which box for each different level. They want to know whether they got um, different marks in different areas and were to expand this on this point here. Now, next part, part, part two of my talk, once upon a GIS story map. So story maps are a really underused resource in our teaching community. 
This one here is my favourite one. This is the Japan Haiti one, um, which is a beautiful comparison with so much facts and so many facts and figures that make it a really, really interesting read and it helps students really compare those two earthquakes in really great amounts of detail. Now, story maps um, you can are uh, created uh, by users or they're created by Ezri themselves. And Ezri wonderfully have created a whole library of these so, um, so you can really easily get them and embed, so, embed so no more maps into your curriculum and there was a really good resource for students to use and expand their knowledge on. Now, you've seen that this is Esri and ArcGIS. I vaguely remember to do something about GIS, maybe from your undergrad or your recent usage, but don't worry, I will be talking about GIS because the wonderful Esri have created this amazing library of resources for GIS tasks that you can embed into your lessons that you do with students and this can um, be given as links to them and they have full um, worksheets that you can give to your students and they can complete. For example, this is one of the River Stour and their flooding. This enables you to look at the geology, uh, the conservation and your flood defences, all with fully resource with loads of um, different activities for students to complete. That was a fantastic talk. But what have I just learned? Well, number one, Rubrics can help you assess and mark students' work as you can recycle them across the different exam questions that you set for students. Number two, Esri has all the story maps and GIS activities for you to embed into your curriculum or to share with colleagues or have a go with yourself. I have added links to these at the bottom of my story map. Thank you so much for watching my talk. I am, any questions can go to at Jog Anna. Bye. Uh, a lot of people worried about the beer. The beer hasn't arrived yet. Um, thank you very much for that, Anna. I've got to apologise. Um, Anna put together a fantastic presentation. Any little glitches there were to do with my fat fingers and um, trying to do a million things at once. So um, that is amazing. We shall move on. Um, so Richard, Richard got in touch with me. He was going to be at the Face to Face Teach Me um, and he was going to be sharing his ideas. Now, I actually lead behaviour at the moment. And I think, you know, how we use um, and take young people out is a real barrier. Um, so in terms in terms of Richard, uh, he says a little bit about himself as well. He's the director of a geography fieldwork centre in Mallorca. Um, hopefully we'll all pop down there. Um, and over the past 30 years, he's worked in 16 countries, four continents, and has really specialised in learning outside the classroom. So he's been a field manager um, uh, of his studies in Catalonia um, and working with GCC IA level and IB students. So we shall uh, see what he's got to say. Hello. This from Mallorca in Spain. My name is Richard and I run a fieldwork centre here on the island. There is Confucian saying, hear and you forget, see and you remember, do and you understand. For me, this sums up why engaging in geography fieldwork is so important for students. However, in my experience, it is easy for teachers, and I include myself here, to forget some basics when teaching outside the classroom. This is why I've created a very simple guide that I hope will help you to remember some do's and don'ts when you are supervising fieldwork. In a classroom, you should have everything in your favour. The pupils can see you, your board and your maps. They can hear you. They're not cold, hungry or thirsty. And unless you're teaching year nine after a PE lesson, the classroom shouldn't smell too bad. Outside the classroom, all of this changes, and it is very easy to lose control of your group. So, let's have a look at some pictures of Ricardo, my alter Lego, sorry, to see what mistakes he has made in his long career in teaching fieldwork. Sight. Here, Ricardo is unaware that none of his group are following his explanation about aspects of rural regeneration as they're all being blinded by the sun. He's fine, but they're certainly not. Here, he's talking about coastal erosion, but unfortunately for him, the students are not paying the least bit of attention due to something more interesting going on behind him. I once witnessed a teacher on a beach giving a fascinating talk to a group of teenagers about sun dune succession, blissfully unaware of the swimwear photo shoot going on behind him. Rapt attention does not mean your pupils are focusing on you. Hearing. Can they actually hear you? Here, Ricardo has chosen to talk about how to do a traffic survey 
next to a busy motorway. Even though he's shouting at the top of his voice, they can't hear him very well. I've seen teachers do this and then wonder why the survey has been carried out incorrectly. Always find a quiet spot for giving people's information. The sense of smell is also very important to consider. Here, students are retching due to the stench of rotting organic produce, as Ricardo talks enthusiastically about sustainable waste management. I've seen it happen. Stand a good distance away, or at least upwind, from anything that smells unpleasant. If you don't, your pupils will be unable to concentrate. And talking of bad smells, please remember to always use deodorant and fresh breath mints. Touch and taste. Here, students are fainting. This is because it's Spain. It's summer. It's extremely hot. And Ricardo has become so enthused by the issue of water security that he has forgotten to find some shade for his group. And he has forgotten to remind them to drink lots of water to, become, uh, to avoid becoming dehydrated. Perhaps a Northern European equivalent would be a teacher talking to a group in winter in a torrential rainstorm, having forgotten to ensure everyone was wearing a raincoat and had eaten a good breakfast. Here, remembering the senses of touch and of taste will help to prevent problems. So, to recap, when leading geography fieldwork, a geography teacher needs to remember the senses. Are your students safe? Are they too hot, cold or wet? Are they hungry or thirsty? And can they see and hear you? Is there an unpleasant smell in the area? And are there any other distractions? Finally, let's look at Ricardo getting things right. Here, he's on a beach again, talking about seagrass. He's in an elevated position so everyone can see him. There's no one behind him to divert attention. He's far enough away from the water so that no one is distracted by the sound of crashing waves. The rotting seagrass is also at a safe distance in terms of smell. The group are all dressed appropriately for the conditions and they all have a large bottle of water to avoid dehydration. He's got it all covered. Now, this all might seem blindingly obvious, but there are so many times when I've seen fantastic classroom teachers having problems outside by just forgetting about one of the five senses. This is why I wanted to share my thoughts with you. Thank you for listening and stay safe. Thank you very much, Richard, for that. And um, as I said, this is absolutely fantastic. We've still got that 340 of you um, online. So do keep commenting. There's lots of tweets flying around, which is fantastic. Um, I've got to say that I haven't um, curated or kind of changed um, any of, of these. And in fact, because um, usually we're in the same space as the GA um, sort of like posh do afterwards like quiz or something we're usually kicked out so um, I've squeezed in as much as we can so we can just get hearing um, for such a diverse range. Um, the next speaker I, I absolutely love uh, listening to always gives uh, something different and some real food um, for thought. Um, Kit and Theo are um, and were in the uh, the Zoom, so um, you know, do say hello. Um, Kit is a freelance educator, trainer, and blogger at georamblings.com, um, a high school geography teacher of 13 years. And the real star of the show, Theo, is a five year old geographer currently in year one. And here we go. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. I'm Kit. Hi, guys. And we're going to have a look at some really lovely children's book that you can use to teach young children a bit of geography. So we're going to start with this one. This one is called Me. And what's this one all about? It's about it's about a little penguin um see um see um um fly, um, 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 um saying um um and the um, um stuff is deep and and steep mm -hmm. and and tall and. I am small, that's what he says. Yeah, and this is a really good book to teach about Antarctica and extreme environments by the view of a little tiny penguin. So, for example, he gets buffeted by the strong winds there, and it's kind of nice to learn a bit like the harsh environments of Antarctica there. Okay, let's go for, how about this one? Let's stay in Antarctica. What's this one called? It's called Blown Away, and Antarctica, Antarctica is, um, is also... It's also an um, um, continent. Yeah, and you know what I really love about this one? So 
there's actually one thing that made me really, really kind of, um, well, they meet a polar bear, and why does, why does Daddy not like books with polar bears and penguins in them, Theo? Because polar bears <laughs> live in the, in the North Pole, not the South Pole, and penguins right. live in the South Pole. But the good thing about this book, do you remember what's in that book that makes it okay? Do you remember what that, that bit was? So if I show it to the screen, but, the, but we notice this, which shows a map, shows that, that yeah. Clive the bear from the, from, from the North Pole to the South Pole. That's right. Um, because, um, um, because that the little penguin who got the kite was, 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 was um, Clive's friend. Mm -hmm. So, and they go to a tropical island and they didn't like it there because it was too hot. hot. It was too hot for them. But there was ice cream. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a really lovely one. Um, and it redeemed, well, I think I was deliberate to kind of have a bit of a poke of people who mix their polar bears and, and their, and their uh, penguins there. Now, this is a really good one, isn't it, Leo? So this is a very yes. famous one. Now, a lot of people might know this one. So what's this one called? It's called Stick Man. And it's yep. about, and it's about, and it's about, it's about a, a stick where, with a stick family um, and the stick man goes on an adventure and, mm -hmm. and he, he has, get, identically gets um, captured by a dog and then, and then a girl and then he gets thrown into the river and mm. then he gets washed to sea. Ah, uh, you see, now that's the bit of geography that I think is great because it, it shows you different landscapes and you can explore different landscapes. And then, so, Yep. used for a flag yeah. <laughs> on the seaside and it goes through different seasons as well so you can explore the different seasons and different landscapes about stickman's journey of getting lost right um here's a good one out at home now this is one that is an american author called arnold rebel who wrote the frog and toad series but there's a particular story of owl at home i like and it's read theo's going to read this one page for you so he's he's at home he's snuggling at home with some hot soup and it's winter time outside, and then he hears a knocking on the door, and Theo's going to read this here. Go on, from there, Theo. Uh, no one was there, only the snow and the cold. Poor old winter is knocking at my door, said Al. Perhaps it wants to sit by the fire. Well, I will be kind and let the winter come in. I'll open the the door very wide. Come in, Winter, said Al. Come in and warm yourself for a while. Right, so there he is letting Winter. But the trouble is, is that when he opens the door, what happens? It, um, it, it destroys, it makes a blizzard, oh. and then his pea soup goes, goes, turns into ice and the fire goes out. And actually, this is a really good way of teaching um, the different kind of air masses and air types. So for example, when you've got very cold air and it's very dense, and you open the door and then it rushes into that area of warm air and less dense air and that pressure gradient is dragging it. So it's not really winter knocking on the door, it's just the differences in air pressure and density. You can of course teach that concept very, very clearly using that nice little story, which is wonderful, like the phys you know, the physics behind why Owl let winter in it, it went whooshing around his house. But he, um, he had to shut, when he shut the door, it went away, didn't it? So, okay, and Theo is, so this one's for a little bit of the older ones now. This is an old book, you can get it. Um, I'll put, let's see, this is Ingrid Shelberg, Our Changing World, and you love this one, Theo. So tell us a little bit about this one then. It's, so if I hold it like that. It's about seasons and it's about changing and you can um, it, you can see that you can do this with them and it's, it's about summertime or winter time and, and 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 it's also and it's also uh, and it's also about um it's it's also about the sea mm -hmm. and when the tide goes in and the tide goes out yeah so that one's called our changing world by ingrid selberg so that's one of your favorite ones isn't it because you're learning about the different the way that the world changes through different seasons in different parts Okay, so that's just um, five of our favourite stories, just general stories that you could use to teach some geography to young children. So thank you very much for your help here. That was very nice for your insight, your expert insight, geographer's son, eh? But uh, like all children, yeah, okay. So um, have fun with the rest of the teach me, everybody. Bye. 
Absolutely fantastic uh, kit. And Theo, thank you very much for that. Lots of good uh, books there. And I hope those um, primary colleagues in the audience can do that. Um, I think we've got the largest audience of any Teach Me. I think we've got the youngest presenter and I think we've got the furthest attendees. So please remember, do use the hashtag, use Twitter, use the YouTube comments, um, share what your thoughts are. I hope you're hearing us loud and clear. Um, we will also be sharing all the links for the presenters and the, the original um, videos. So you'll be able to look at those and share those um, at your pleasure. Next up, we've got Paul Turner and Paul Turner is the head of geography at a school in Hampshire and he considers himself an environmental and social activist. Been looking forward to this one, uh, so enjoy. Welcome to the launch of the Radical Geographer's Handbook. Radical Geography has been around since the 1960s and Antipode, the Journal of Radical Geography, started publishing in 1969. Um, radical geography in the classroom uh, is something a little newer and teachers have often been reluctant to engage in a radical sense with their students. Now, the economic, political, social and environmental global issues that we are increasingly experiencing have created a sense of urgency. Uh, we must challenge business as usual. The time is now. We all need to be more radical you can access the handbook online. Here are some fellow radical geographers. Hello, I'm Alan Parkinson. And even in my bedroom, on lockdown, I am a radical geographer. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kit, and I'm radical in so many ways, but in no more so than geography. Just being who I am and existing as who I am and letting geography help me to share that makes me very, very radical. Hi, I'm Paul. I'm a radical geographer because I like to challenge the status quo. Hi there, I'm Ben. Uh, I'm a radical geographer. Uh, we want to ensure that we see students really engaging with data and uh, evidence so that they can really take part in some of the really big issues in geography. Uh, things like climate change, migration, uh, and things, even things like Brexit, maybe politics political ideas, uh, but being informed so that they can take part in these debates uh, and create a positive social change. Uh, and that's what I think radical job food should be about. Now more than ever, we need to resist the comfort of armchair geography and start asking, teaching and debating the questions no one else dares to ask. I'm a radical job food because I demand the teachers and students tackle stereotypes and um, review their misconceptions and spend time and energy finding out what the real world is like. My name is David and I am a radical geographer. I believe that geography plays a crucial role in helping young people to appreciate and respect our planet. It also helps them to look forward to a future filled with hope, faith in human progress and mutual understanding. Hello. So what I'm going to do now then is just uh, go through the booklet and show you and talk about some, some more of it. But what I wanted to start with was just to say again that, you know, this is playful in the sense that um, we're trying to be a little bit provocative uh, in what we're doing. But it's also really important because we are trying to, in our opinion, focus on what we think are some of the most important global issues. Um, and, and what we're trying to say is that there are teachers who are doing these sorts of things and there are people who have got maybe different practices or, or alternative approaches and they're using quite innovative and creative tools but what we are saying is we need to bring that to the masses we need to get most teachers doing these things and that's the only way that we're then going to um, uh, properly tackle and scale up the impact of, of, of these things um, so what we've got here is a kind of poster girl of the environmental movement this is greta the thing I wanted to focus on was this idea that she says no one is too small to make a difference. And that's also a key message in terms of what we're saying is that both for teachers and for um, students, that when you as a, as a teacher in your classroom, you are in control of what you're saying and the activities and the images and the videos that you might use. And just subtle changes in the way that you emphasize language or the words you use or the um, examples that you incorporate.
incorporate into your lessons can have a really dramatic impact in terms of students' understanding um, of the nature of the world. Uh, we've got here this um, sit, uh, list of 11 challenges, and some of these you know you might have um, already started thinking about, but the, the key one here is this idea that we're, we're saying, look, you need to teach what you love and not to the exam. The uh, exam syllabus is not the curriculum. The curriculum is for you as a teacher using your own agency to kind of construct and it's that that you should have and play greater importance than some sort of assessment objectives. Um, what about though uh, you could challenge the school community to score 100% on the gap mind or ignorance test? Look, this is something that a lot of schools have jumped on board with and said, look, um, I've got the backing of the head teacher. We want everyone in the school going to use an assembly and, and share it through some sort of online platform and get everyone to have a go at the test. And they have to keep doing it until they get 100%. Um, you could um, look at how much carbon is locked away in the trees in your on your school site or in your local town, and, and then you can do action so that you can triple it. Uh, the focus of a lot of this is actually saying, Let, let's get people using their human agency to, to improve the world and to change things. Um, so we've got the, the conference bingo here that hopefully you've been using. But the, the other key message is this idea of hope in that we are saying... Um, is through um, a better understanding of the world that you actually can become more hopeful. And by understanding your uh, place within it and the ability for you to be able to um, improve and change the world, you can make the world the place that you want it to be. And therefore you can make it a sort of positive and better place. And that's all about them making the world happier and healthier, both for people, but also the planet itself. Um, so we've got stuff here about um, uh, climate change and the Anthropocene, the stuff about plastics, all of this kind of alternative perspective will actually look, um, the majority of plastic in the oceans, 46% comes from fishing gear, and only 0.03% comes from plastic straws, well, you know, are we focusing on the right thing? Uh, stuff about how we engage with public space and open spaces, and how much space we give to, to children, and the ability for them to feel safe. Um, uh, you've got the ideas about activism, is activism learning? Um, you know, where is the line in particular? Um, where is it, when does it become sort of propaganda or using children to, to, to for your own means um, to spread a message? Um, things like GDP, things about income. Um, you know, what is it, normal income? And normal income in the UK, where does that place you in the rest of the world? These are some of this is really powerful. That if you properly understand it, you can then understand um, your place in the world in a better way. Thinking about uh, film work, and a lot of the time we sort of minimise the imagination that students are allowed and the freedom and the creativity within film work. Um, flying for school trips, you know, is it crazy? Even offsetting, carbon offsetting, is it a genuine activity? Um, women and sort of emancipation of women, well, actually, how much has changed over the last hundred years? Particularly in schools, you know, the kind of percentages are really stark. Language that we use, you know, using outdated language, the students have an up-to-date uh, worldview. Um, you know, provocative activities like saying, let's go for a poverty safari, where we need to go to find the richest or the poorest or the average street in our local area, and using that then as a platform for discussion. Putting the face to a lot of these um, issues, you know, using imagery and people rather than just numbers and data. Um, we've also then this is these are some sort of future forward thinking organisations, and the more you can incorporate those ideas and their resources into your teaching, that's much the better. These are books that definitely every teacher should read, and even you should be encouraging your students to, and they really open up the way then that you engage with certain issues. Um, we've also then got uh, Ed Hawkins' Warming Stripes here. Again, another really visual impact about the, the stark um, representation of climate change there. Yeah, and I'm just going to finish with, the, you know, this is where we're at. This is the world we're in, 413 parts per million. And this is the urgency that we need and the reason that we need to be more radical. Thank you very much uh, for that, Paul. So as I said, all of this um, will be shared and we'll make all of the, the talks and resources available to you afterwards. A quick uh, beer update. The flagons are still empty. Um, we're hoping the doorbell will go um, soon, but I hope you're all well, whatever your uh, drink will be. Um,
Jack, I've been following Jack for, uh, for a long time. Um, I've worked for two head teachers who were geographers. Um, I've worked in SLT where three of the six were geographers. Um, and I'm really looking forward to uh, Jack's because it shows that actually a lot of the geography is um, is applicable um, across the school. And I think as geographers, we really have that global um uh, global thinking. So I love the fact that Jack says uh, his first thing he says he's a geography teacher and a deputy head at Farnham Heath End School in Surrey. He organises uh, the Research Ed Surrey and is a co-organiser at Brew Ed Brighton. More on that uh, when uh, this current situation um, is over because that will be back. My main passion, his main passion is research informed practice and teacher development and he currently leads on teaching and learning and teacher development. Uh, so enjoy this from Jack. Okay, good evening everyone. Um, I'm going to be talking about one of the fundamental building blocks of effective teaching, um, specifically around tight transitions between the teacher's instructional phase and the students actually doing work. Uh, quite often we'll see teachers spending a huge amount of time on planning and resources and making sure that they're designed um, to the absolute max, but too little do we see teachers really spending time on how they're going to implement um, that, that planned lesson and how they're going to make it as efficient as possible for, for all students to try and make um, the lesson as inclusive as possible. So this is going to be a really quick whiz through nine things that we do here at Farnham Heath End School in the geography department, but also across the whole school and to try and make um, lessons as inclusive for everyone. Some of them I'm going to talk about in depth, some of them I will, I will literally whistle past. So this is an amalgamation of some Teach Like a Champion strategies called Tight Transitions and Brighton Lines. Um, and they're nine key parts to, to every lesson to ensure that the transition between the teacher's instructional phase and students doing is efficient and students uh, they can therefore give their best at the first time of asking. So the first thing that we insist upon is silence. Um, and students that can giving eye contact and all equipment down. This just makes sure that we are saying that the subject, in this case geography, is the most important thing and the teacher is the expert at the front of the room and therefore the subject and the expert deserve respect and they deserve silence um, because it's very difficult to do two things at once. Making eye contact is making sure that we're trying to move away from students being passive in the classroom and all equipment down means that there is going to be no fiddling or with anything during the teacher giving instructions. Number two, we move straight into modelling the success cr criteria of the task. Students need to know what's expected uh, of them during the task, how they get there, hopefully through chunked instructions, and what great looks like. Um, it's really important to make sure that those chunked instructions um, and the success criteria are written down because too often we forget as teachers that our words are transient and once they've been said for a lot of students they actually forget those words so make sure they're written down somewhere even on a powerpoint slide or a couple of key terms or you know chunking of, of, of tasks on a whiteboard just means that all students will be able to refer back to that information during the task give a clear um, time limit for the task is number three just sets expectations and builds a culture of challenge. You expect them to do the geography within the time that you're giving them. Obviously, if you need to increase the time, do so, but it just means that there is that level of challenge throughout. Number four is clearly stating resources. So many times we see teachers uh, firefighting during lessons, hands go up after the teacher has finished doing their explanation, um, asking questions like what textbook pages was it? Do we have to use an atlas? Do we need to use a pencil? All of the things that are absolutely basic, just clearly state those resources and perhaps put them onto a whiteboard somewhere just so that they can refer back to the textbook pages and what equipment it is that they need during the task. Again, it just frees up their um, you know, the cognitive loads, so they can actually really start to think about geography rather than uh, what resources are required to achieve the task. Uh, number five is set task conditions. Really be explicit here. Too often what we see is teachers using the word quiet, which is a really subjective word. Quiet for some students is going to be very different from quiet for others. And similarly, quiet for some teachers is different to some others. Silence or silent work is is explicit, it's, it's unambiguous, it means that students know the expectations and also they know that their, their work is going to be their work and it's independent work and it allows the teacher to check it. Similarly, if it's paired work or group tasks, 
just be really explicit about what you want during that paired activity, what you want through the group task, who does what, how long is that going to last for. Really make it explicit and then the students know exactly what they're meant to be doing in terms of task conditions. Number six is a, is a real key one. Too often we see this um, not being done. Um, and, it's, and it's just asking a student, um, normally a student who perhaps you are sometimes concerned can be a little bit sort of, um, you know, not 100% listening perhaps or, or can go off on a tangent during the work. Get them to repeat the instructions back to you. Really good tactics for send students uh, as well. Uh, and get them to, you know, not only just talk about the success criteria, but what's the time limit, what resources required, what are the task conditions. Really checking the understanding of the task, but also the clarity of your instruction. And uh, we rarely see this being done and it's been a real push and it has massively um, increased the level of inclusivity in lessons. Um, number seven, um, obviously scan the room. Um, check whether students have, have begun learning. It seems obvious, but too often there is this sort of moment where the teacher thinks, right, my explanation's done. I can just, you know, there's that sort of 30 seconds where you're sort of trying to think, what is it that I'm going to go and go on to do next uh, in the lesson and the, in the planning? But really obviously scan the room and break the line, get past that first row away from your desk or away from the board, wherever it may be, and go and check that students have actually begun the task. That also ramps up challenge for students. It develops a culture of learning. And it also says that this is your classroom and they're here to learn geography. And numbers eight and nine are, are really interesting and they're probably the toughest for teachers to, to change in terms of um, their implementation of, of lessons, especially if they've been teaching for quite a while. Um, and it's turning it around from anonymously um, sort of telling those that are complying, I hate that word, but it's sort of, you know, those that are meeting expectations normally we don't tell them that they're, they're doing that and there's an anonymity to it. Whereas actually what we've tried to do is actually, you know, praise those that meet expectations, those that started well, those that have used the sense and start, so those that, you know, are following the expectations and anonymously challenge those that aren't. Um, and what that does, again, is just sets the culture that you're really wanting. It doesn't focus on those that are off task by name. It doesn't provide them with any attention. Um, and it instead focuses on the positives in the, in, in the lesson and learning. Um, so phrases like just waiting for two pupils to start or 90% of us have begun, let's have 100%. They're really low threat, but they're high challenge in terms of getting students to learn. Um, there's lots more that I could have said about the, 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 the one to nine, we call it a fun and event school. Um, but, you know, the, I think the key things that I need to, to get over to you is, is that checking of students understanding becomes, you know, means that your lessons are becoming more inclusive. There is a real challenge being added for all. So you're teaching to the top and scaffolding upwards. It sets the highest expectations and a culture of learning and really shows the importance of geography and reduces the likelihood of students being locked out of their learning because they've had to show that there is an understanding of, of, of what the tasks are and you're demanding the high expectations expectations of engagement and it allows the teacher then to go and focus on the one or two that you know are going to need that little bit of extra support um, so that's sort of the, the end of the presentation if you want to contact me a little bit more um, then please do my twitter handle is at jog marsh and i'm more than happy to share the documentation that we have around this thank you very much for listening bye, -bye. And thank you very much, Jack. Um, and I think it all goes to show there, you know, those high expectations and what we would think about behaviour and routines really does help with the learning. Um, next up, we have um, Rebecca. And as I say, do uh, keep sharing your comments. Use the hashtag on Twitter. Um, again, we will share all of this information um, at the end. Uh, we've still got almost 300 of you. Um, so and I really appreciate that. It's absolutely fantastic uh, and makes me trying to be really quiet all this time. Uh, really really worthwhile so um, next up is uh, Rebecca um, she qualified as a geography teacher in 2007 and worked at an extremely large secondary school in Newcastle um, in 2013 she moved to a school in Northumberland as a head of department and is now an assistant vice principal in the school um, trains for Edexcel and specializes in GCSE spec a uh, and this is a number of presentations around the vocabulary and I think really um, vocabulary especially within geography and every other subject is absolutely crucial to success. Okay so I'm looking at, looking at how to close the vocabulary gap and I've been doing this since my year 10 this year. 
So what was the rationale behind doing this? Well, in our August 2019 data capture, um, we saw there was a large gap between our grade three and our grade four students, and our grade four and our grade five students. And also there was a, um, this was a whole school picture. So looking further into this, it actually showed from the results post that lots of students lost what we would call easy marks on the one mark defined questions. And then on the other shorter one mark questions. So for example, in rivers and coasts, name one type of weathering, name one type of erosion. Now, when I came to do these style of questions with my year 10s, I asked why was it difficult? And it was because they didn't understand what weathering erosion meant, or they just didn't know what the key term meant that would be asked. So for example, and they changed in cities topic, it was the word periphery, and they just didn't know what the word periphery meant. Um, I also looked at when I was marking books and formative assessment, why students weren't doing very well in some of the exam questions. And this was because they didn't know what the geography words meant. Um, they understood the command word, we've done a lot of work on that, but they didn't actually understand what the tier three language was all about. So in the old in the autumn term, I started just by doing regular vocabulary tests where each week they were given a chunk of vocab to learn. The homework was to make flashcards and this fitted in to our whole school strategy about making flashcards as a revision tool. Um, they got a weekly pass mark and then if they didn't pass, they had to resit it. And students did quite well to start with. So um, most students quite got engaged in the immediate feedback. They liked the competition. Um, and the most conscientious of the girls and boys in my class actually did very well, but it led to the vocabulary gap widening. My mixed ability class of the students from grade seven to four, I found that students at the bottom end of that spectrum really struggled with learning vocabulary. Um, they struggled with doing homework as well, so the idea of making flashcards and then having to spend some time learning them was challenging to them. And they found the actual vocab sheets quite daunting. There was a lot of stuff on there all at once. So I started to have a little bit of a think about this and I looked about on Twitter and I did some reading and I started to look at this idea of dual coding. And before I could even start thinking about how this would link to the vocab tests and building up that, I had to choose symbols that I could use in my glossary sheets, I could use in my lessons, I could use in my knowledge organisers, I could use in my take three, my take five, and I had to make sure I had those, those sort of symbols ready and to use. I also looked at what kind of visual pictures and that visual channel would work for students, and it was the clear, strong images uh, and then obviously I used Noun Project to help me out. Um, and actually this did work because students found it quite engaging and we found that student engagement increased during this time. Their scores then began to increase in the vocabulary tests and um, with that confidence in using the language came. So we then saw an improvement in exam questions. Now that might be for many other factors as well, but I started to see students underlining and highlighting key terms in their exam questions and writing little annotations to show what they meant. And um, that then meant they could do better in some of the more higher ability cognitive demanding activities. And I then started to think about, well, how do I test this? Because actually giving them a definition and then just get them to write the keyword is quite straightforward. But we know students are really going to learn these things and really embed them in their longer term memory. There needs to be some kind of challenge in the test. So instead of giving them the definitions, I just gave them the pictures. And in the first week, students just had to write the key term. In the second week, students had to write the definitions and the key terms. In the third week, some of those keywords were taken out and other ones were replaced. I also make, made sure that all of this was done through self-assessment and that took away some of the fear factor. And we weren't looking now for students to get six out of six or 12 out of 12. We were looking at, could they identify their own misconceptions and where they went wrong and therefore what they needed to relearn for the following week. Now, unfortunately, COVID-19 happened and um, the, I've been doing this for about six to eight weeks and we were beginning to get somewhere, but we will continue when we, we go back to school. But I think what really helped with this style test is that it was challenging and therefore students had to think. And therefore this is making them try and remember things and embed it in the longer term memory rather than maybe in the stage one activities where they just learned the key terms for that week. 
so where will I take this next? Well, I, I really like this idea and my students have really engaged in it, but there's more to it. And um, we will keep going and obviously I will update all my vocab sheets and we will make sure it all links together. Um, I also think I need to add in key terms from previous topics to help with retrieval practice. And also I think maybe when we're going to look at case studies and revising case studies, this could be a good method to choose as well. Because it, students don't have to get everything right I'm not collecting the marker necessarily. What I want to see is, can they close the misconception from week to week? And therefore, does that have a better impact on their exam results? And I'm happy to share what I've done so far. And uh, if you follow me on Twitter and you want to ask for it, please ask. And um, if you've got any questions, please also pop them on Twitter. We'll put them in the notes feed for our Zoom chat. Anyway, thank you. And thank you, Rebecca. So uh, next up, um, as I say, we've got uh, lots of news here and um, we had to put on the age restriction just because Emily is going to actually uh, speak live. Um, so um, I'm just going to unshare the screen while Emily shares her. Um, Emily is an NQT and she's an NQT geography teacher in London. And so uh, has taken the brave step of going, no, she's going to do it live and show. So. I'm going to stop my share uh, and hopefully you can um, all uh, still see me um, and within the Zoom, um, all the speakers are here. Um, as we're waiting for that, as I say that the beer update um, hasn't arrived uh, yet. We're still waiting for that. Um, and we still have almost 300 of you um, around uh, the place. So um, very best of luck, Emily. You can find her on uh, Chandler Jog on Twitter. Okay, so um, I'm looking at raising attainment through tier two vocabulary. Um, initially, this came apart as part of my PGCE assignment last year. Um, and then I carried on doing this within the department. I'm currently working in, in my NQT year. So, bit of background to start with. Uh, so I'm focusing on tier two words, so the high frequency uh, words that often come up in written texts, but maybe don't come up uh, so often in spoken language, so students may not be aware of them. Um, so they're not the tier one words, which are the words that students come across in spoken language, and not the tier three subject specific words that um, we often teach. So tier two words, really important, but students aren't always aware of these. Um, so to start with thinking about exam questions. Um, so if there are tier two words in the question that students aren't aware of, uh, could be the command words, could be other tier two words, then they would struggle to answer the question even if they know the geography. Uh, so just an example, there, um, in the examiner's report, it was picked up that uh, students often ignored the command word assess. Uh, so because they missed out on that tier two word, they couldn't get the marks, even if they had the geographical knowledge. So things that I've tried to help um, teach these tier two words in lessons when you're practicing exam questions, uh, really breaking up the question, defining all of the uh, words. So not just the command word, not just the geography, but every word that comes up so that the students are really clear on what they have to do, building up their vocabulary in the classroom 
um, before the exam. Uh, second example is just providing the definition of the command word, could be done with other tier two words as well. Um, again, just to make sure that students are really familiar with that. Um, the next example, so actually teaching these tier two words as keywords. So um, either words that are really, really important for them to understand the lesson um, or words that students may not necessarily be familiar with. And the first example um, was from a lesson with one of my nurture classes, um, thinking about what it's like to live in a really remote settlement. So defining the word remote, because if students aren't aware of that, they would really struggle uh, to access the lesson and to understand what I wanted them to get from that lesson. The second example, um, they're thinking about describing the location of a place. Um, again, defining the word location, because if students aren't aware about um, what location actually means, they would struggle to be able to fully answer that question. Um, next example, similar to defining the keywords, but instead of uh, using written definitions, putting in pictures instead. So first example, um, thinking about categorizing effects into social, economic, environmental, providing picture cues because if students are not sure about what social means, what economic means, um, they wouldn't be able to access the task. So making it really clear for them. Uh, second example, again, providing pictures, getting students to think about what we mean by monitoring hazards, um, protection from hazards. Uh, before going on to actually go through those in more detail. And then the final idea, uh, so breaking the words down. Uh, this could be done with tier two and tier three words. Um, these two examples, using students' knowledge of tier two words, uh, to help them understand the geographical concepts. So first example, thinking about the global atmospheric circulation, uh, splitting that down, getting the students to try and work out what it is through their understanding of global atmosphere and circulation. Uh, second example, so breaking the word down into different components, um, thinking about what does climate mean, what does micro mean, and using that to work out what a microclimate is. Um, okay, that's it for me. Thank you. Brilliant and pretty much spot on time, Emily. So uh, fantastic. And um, let's just see if I can get back to what I was sharing. Uh, uh, there we go. Um, so NQT speaking live to 300 people, sharing some really fundamental ideas there. And it's really important, you know, Teach Meets are all about listening to lots of different people uh, from around um, the world, different disciplines, things that you don't necessarily agree with and things that are really useful and those really basic. So Emily, well done. And also um, a tip for me, if I ever do this again, is to put you earlier on in the lineup because uh, Leah and I could actually talk, Triven could bark uh, and I could make uh, some noisy um, sort of beer making activities. So thank you very much. We have uh, three uh, amazing stories left and we're going to move on um, to Tom. Uh, Tom's been a teacher since 2013 and in this, the uh, the sort of storyteller chat we're having a chat about universities and so on uh, he's a current head of uh, department enthusiastic about teaching and learning books and geography 
and hopefully supporting um, the wonderful geography teacher community. Do come and say hello. And what I've got to say is that the geography teacher community, uh, lots of negativity happens on Twitter and we seem to sail above that. And I think probably that's because geography teachers are just that, that higher level um, of of person, maybe with the exception of uh, Matt Podbury, Podbury but uh, you know, we'll uh, take it from there. So here we go, Tom, and uh, we'll speak to you soon. I'm Tom Heinet, Heinet uh, John Nine, you probably know me as on Twitter. Uh, I'm here to talk to you this evening about how to use text in the geography classroom. So I put a few of the texts on the slide there. It's some of the most amazing texts going in the geography class at the moment, but I'd always love to know more, so please come tell me something on Twitter. And I want to start off by talking about well, why do we use text in our job classrooms. Um, and we kind of stripped down to three main reasons, really. Firstly, reading is absolutely transformational. It gives you exposure to new language. It's utterly transformational for the way that you see the world. So you combine geography with geography academic reading, and you've got an absolutely different way of perceiving the world. So it's hugely powerful for our students. Uh, that exposure to new vocabulary is crucial. The more vocabulary students know, the more they can engage with different texts, different sources, different information around the world. So again, it comes back to that point, transformational. And finally, you deepen your curriculum, you promote a true love of your subject, you take students deeper into the more complex debates that are happening in our subject today. So geography is unique in many ways, it's a living subject. There's constant research and refinements of theories and understanding that we have, and that by exposing our students to this through text, we're given the very best geography we can. I'm going to give you a brief bit of advice about how we are beginning to use text in our lesson. First piece of advice, be explicit in your planning of how you're going to use the text. So when I first came across business geography, I was completely blown away how, how fantastic it was. Read chapter five in Africa and thought, oh my goodness me, I'm going to take this in and read my year seven and it's going to change their lives. And it didn't, uh, mostly because I didn't plan how I was going to use it. I read the first two or three pages to them. They had extracts, they were highlighting and taken away. And then one kid put their hand up and said, I don't know what my car projection is. And then that spiraled a whole load of, well, I don't know what this means, I don't know what that means, because I wasn't clear. So actually now, when we use prison geography and we use chapter five and we plan into our Africa topic, we set a question at the start of that lesson, which is, why are many African countries very underdeveloped? And students are able, because they're prior learn, to add a few reasons, that's great, we collate those, but then we use the text to dig really deep into those. If you've got a copy of a prison geography nearby, go to chapter five, the first two or three pages of that text are fantastic at digging into why many African countries are so underdeveloped. So it takes our students initial understanding, it really helps them to deepen it and, and take it further. So a big takeaway for that, set a really clear focus on how you're using the text, what question you're trying to answer. Select key vocabulary and teach it explicitly. We give our students a keyword sheet, a glossary to use when reading new text. Decide who's reading as well. So I'll come back to that in a little bit. Second thing, uh, we only ever start with extract. Now I know there's some wonderful work done on the importance of exposing students to a whole text, but we are very much in the position at the moment of starting with extracts and building up. Now, for an extract on the slide there of When the Rivers Run Dry by Fred Pierce, wonderful book, absolutely go and get it if you can. Um, I'm not going to read that extract to you now, you can pause it, read it in your own time. But we use that along with the following question. We pose a question, why is water important as part of a resources topic? And students are able to give us a few ideas, a bit like our year sevens in Africa. But actually, by having that at text, the students are able to take their, their understanding so much further so they can deepen their understanding. some fantastic geography in there that we can explore with our students. So it's starting with extracts and building up. And, and finally, this is what it might look like during and post reading with our students. We've relied heavily on the EEF here and their theory of reciprocal reading. And I'm firmly in the belief that the teacher is the expert. So they should be the one reading to students. And that's something we gradually take that support away as students move into higher year groups with year seven eight particularly. We're using a text. I would expect my staff to be reading to the students and questioning them throughout. Uh, share the traffic lights. The traffic lights are the name we give to those tricky new key terms, key sentences that students won't have come across before. 
So we stop and we share the traffic lights that we stop together and we unpack what it means and then we're able to go on together. But actually being really clear with students, there's going to be new vocabulary and there's going to be new terms that they're not sure about being really clear about what those actually mean. And as it says here about reciprocal reading, you look down the bottom, we've got the diagram down here. Um, whenever we've read a text, we ask the students to summarise the text. What did they find out? Are they able to answer the question we set? We get them to question and clarify. Is there anything they're not sure about? Is there something they'd like to know more about and take their understanding further? And finally, we even use it to predict. So what do we think could happen next? What do we think is going to happen to water use in the future? Based on what we've read in Fred Pierce's book, what's going to happen to the amount of food production and, and its relation with water? We're going to take it further, give it a geographical prediction on it. Um, Simply put, great tech can be powering up your curriculum. There are so many fantastic texts out there at the moment spread across a wide range of topics. And I don't know them all, but please come and speak to me on Twitter about them and, and I'll share our experience what we're using. But they should be powering up your curriculum. Unashamedly, academic and, and pushing the very best for our students. I'll link to this. Um, blog icons on Twitter are on Twitter book club as well so definitely go and check that out on twitter as well if you haven't already thank you so much for your time this evening please come continue the conversation with me on twitter so drop us on the thank you very much tom that was uh, very useful we're almost there we've got two more um stories up ladies and gentlemen and again remember we'll share all of this i'll share all the links to the original looms um, and any other resources that the um, storytellers have shared but do remember get in touch with them um, on twitter also uh, do keep your comments coming we're still um you know 250 of you listening thank you so much i know that is phantom of the opera and i'm not going to do too much singing uh, a slightly slight apology um it's at matt podbury um that i should have uh, said that comment about earlier so uh sorry matt there we go and um we are going to move on and uh, we have Kelly up next and uh, Kelly is the head of department at the Vine Community School in Hampshire. Her key interests are in teaching and learning and recently held responsibility for sharing ideas across the county as an acting role as county inspector and advisor for secondary geography. I'm really excited about this one because really I was a, a geography teacher who just sort of uh, turned up and, and kind of, you know, was a paycheck teacher. Then I came across Jeff Stanfield, who uh, really sort of transformed my practice and, and sort of gave me uh, the proverbial boot up the backside. So uh, enjoy this about field work. In day to day geography at the Vine Community School within Hampshire, um, I'm wanting to share with you today some ideas that we use in order to include fieldwork um, techniques and fieldwork data collection within our classrooms and within the school grounds. So how we can make use of our classrooms, how we can make use of the school grounds in order to expose students to as many fieldwork techniques as possible. Um, my first idea is by modelling or simulating geographical processes within the classroom. And I've included an example here to show you. Um, photograph on the left, students have created a model using Jenga um, to demonstrate for me um, evidence of longshore drift along a beach. So the Jenga packaging represents a groin and I would expect to see the sediment i.e. the Jenga blocks to be higher on one side of the groin in comparison to the other. Now the key here is actually to complete data collection within the classroom so students can actually use a ruler in order to measure the distance between the top of the groin to the top of the packaging and the top of the sediment on both sides of the groin. You can see in the middle photograph the students created a table with side A and side B and they've measured for me the distance between the top of the groin and the top of the sediment. Um, measurements here are tiny um, and this is of course on a much smaller scale and and it takes a lot of imagination and creativity uh, for students to see this but i find that when we do take students in year 10 down to swanage bay and they complete groin drops for us um, they're so much more confident they've got their team strategy ready as to how they're actually going to complete um, their data collection and they're just much more confident with what they're doing um, in addition, after practicing this on a small scale in the classroom, we can always preempt any issues that we're going to um, come across in the field. And so I find this really, really useful um, for our students. We're really lucky at the Vine as well because we have a quad. And so we use the quad, we use the steps in the quad in order to practice measuring the angle of the beach. 
um, and other ideas include using pebbles or stones or sediment in order to actually practice measuring sediment size, practice um, comparing sediment shapes. You can take the sediment and ask the students to order them from upper course down to the lower course of a river. Where would I expect to find all of these different types of sediment? <clears throat> Um, idea number two is searching for evidence of geographical processes actually on your school site. Um, so once a, an idea has been taught within the classroom, so an example here is weathering, um, my students know the different types of weathering, they can explain um, the processes, they can consider the factors that, that influence weathering along the coastline. I'll now send students outside just for 10-15 minutes in order to find evidence of weathering on the school site and to create for me a field sketch. So another kind of fieldwork technique that, that perhaps we need to practice, we need to develop a bit more. Now back in the classroom, this is the bit um, which I often find students not don't necessarily struggle with, but could develop their points, could expand their points further. And that's by actually annotating their field sketches or annotating photographs that they have taken. So an opportunity to practice this just within one lesson, because the first 10 minutes is a bit of revision, then they go outside and get the evidence, then we use 20, 25 minutes in order to practice our annotations. So using um, field work again, just within one lesson um, at school. Idea number three is one of my favourite fieldwork techniques that we um, use at the fine. That's investigating biodiversity across the school site. Now, as I said earlier, we're really lucky because we have quad, we have school field, we have a hedgerow. Therefore, we create a transect across the school and students use their rulers and they actually sellotape them together to create their own little quadrants. Um, and we use this to identify um, the different plant and the different animal species that students can actually see within their own quadrants um, along the school site at different points. Now again, I like this field wrap because it also opens up opportunity to discuss sampling strategies. Um, is it more effective to sample every single 30 centimetres squared? Should we do every 10 metres, every 20 metres? Should we just do a random site in, in each location? Um, and it opens up discussions as to which sampling techniques are more effective, which sampling techniques are more appropriate um, for our field work that we are actually including. Um, idea number four is congestion mapping of the corridors. Um, now again, this is completed literally within one lesson. Um, students only have two minutes in each location to complete a pedestrian count. Um, and this opens up discussion in terms of how effective our data collection has actually been. Of course, the corridors are always empty because we're completing this in lesson times. Students are quite vocal in terms of if we were doing this at break time, it would be impossible. If we're doing it at lunchtime, some parts would be busier. It would be busier in the autumn term in comparison to the summer term. So it really opens up the discussion in terms of what is effective data collection and what is useful data collection and reliable data collection um, within the classroom. In addition, I ask students to present their data um, in a range of different ways. We can create bar charts, um, proportional symbol maps, and again, it opens up discussion which type of data present presentation sorry, is the most effective and why. Um, my final idea is an attempt to make students or expose students to unfamiliar fieldwork so that the unfamiliar becomes the familiar um, and we try to include fieldwork in all every single topic that we teach across key stage three and key stage four in this case i use data that previous students have collected our local college has collected i have collected um, and we give students the data we explain um, how the data has been collected and we ask students and um, they're in the classroom to always evaluate do you think this is effective um has the way the student collects this data been useful or perhaps accurate um and i just think it's really useful in terms of exposing students to like i said field work that they have not completed so that they can be critical um, and think like geographers in terms of what they would do if they, if they were to do this in the future um, in addition by analyzing someone else's field work um, students are able to reach their own conclusions so using someone else's data to make decisions um, linked to the key inquiry question um, i hope some of these ideas have been useful and are transferable to your own classroom and your own school site. And thank you very much for listening to me today.
Well, thank you very much, Kelly. And we move on. Um, as I said, um, so lots of you out there, lots of comments on the YouTube and on Twitter. Do be reaching out to um, the speakers as well. And we'll make all of this available um, just after this. Um, next up is Simon. Simon is a subject leader of geography in Gloucester. And he's going to talk about what we do um, with those students who are probably very much like myself uh, and maybe lose that little bit of engagement. And welcome to my session on, on reaching to become potentially disengaged at classroom level within geography lessons. Um, so the reason why I'm doing this particular session is that I'm currently a subject leader on geography and one of the things I've really been working on this year is trying to re-engage learners who have become disengaged through various different reasons. Um, first thing that I just want to do very quickly is just go as a reminder, there are varying barriers to learning um, that could potentially uh, lead to disengagement. Uh, there could be with the uh, home circumstances friendship issues we know this as practitioners of teaching um, the main reason I want to go into this one though is uh, through the academic reading that I've been doing um, through uh, the discussions with students um, so a few student panels and discussions with other teachers as well one of the biggest barriers that I've personally found to making sure that we are identifying disengaged students and re-engaging them is issues regarding um, poor self-esteem and um, what I wanted to go through here is just a few of the strategies that I've used um, and reflect on in my practice over the course of 12 past 12 months that I personally have found really successful in trying to rebuild that self-esteem and re-engage learners who potentially have become disengaged within geography lessons in the past. Um, so the first thing that I just wanted to go through is the start of the lesson. Now, I used to be a really big fan of using skills-based um, starters, but nowadays, especially with um, a, a classroom which I feel has got a number of disengaged students, I tend to prefer using low-stakes quizzing. Now, the reason I do that, um, there's a few different reasons. The first reason is that it allows me to track results and if I can track results on how well students are doing for low stakes quizzing by collecting in the results after I've done the register, this allows early identification of students who are potentially becoming disengaged and actually prevention as well. Um, the reason why I say that helps with prevention is that I find um, a number of students when, especially they're having to call out the answers, they really they realise, ah, okay, um, I don't want to be that student who gets zero, I really want to engage with this, I want to make sure that I'm doing as well as possible, making sure I circulate at the same time. Um, secondly, uh, I feel it allows for better retention, especially if it's used in conjunction with things like prior notes and knowledge organisers. And thirdly, really important as well, I feel like it really builds a strong positive feeling on learnt material over the long term. Whenever we um, have gone up through a particular topic and then move on to the next topic I always worry that um, if I ask questions on the previous topic in an exam or a different setting that students are not going to have that confidence to make sure that they actually do know that material and by re revisiting that material through low stakes quizzing regularly at the starter I feel like that really does help build that self-esteem and re-engage learners and make sure they are continuously engaged throughout the topics so this is one way that I um, personally do it you can see there that there are a variety of different questions and that's because that's based on different topics that the students have learned over the course of that year. So the first four questions are on the current topic, which you might well work out there is rivers, um, and then going backwards into prior topics as well, making sure that we're regularly reflecting, recalling that knowledge, building that confidence and being able to allow for early intervention of students who are not remembering this material rather than waiting for summative testing or waiting for any form of exam based feedback or marking. Now, the second thing I wanted to go through is regarding um, whenever we do set up exam questions um, and whenever we do formative testing at the end of lessons or after a couple of lessons, what I've personally found is whenever a student feels like they're going in cold without as much potential as possible in front of them, that's when I feel like they seize up, they go, oh, I can't do this, I can't do this, and then they potentially can become disengaged. So some of the things that our department have been working on um, over, over the course of the past year have been as follows. Um, we make sure that we use mnemonics and we're making sure that we've got them displayed both on the board whenever we set an exam question and also in our classroom so students can actually look around the classroom even during testing, even during summative tests. Um, and the the reason we do that is uh, we had discussions with our English department and a couple of the, the English teachers have actually said that they feel like that's a really strong method in their subjects as well because whenever there's a student sat in an exam hall it allows them to use the physical space around them as well building that confidence building that uh, resilience and building that idea that actually I can do this and making sure therefore they do actually engage with all the learning in front of them and with the attempts to solidify and demonstrate that learning as much as possible um, whenever they're doing this as well we do like to use knowledge organizers as much as possible to make sure that students can reflect back if they are stuck 
making sure that it's not just going in absolutely cold. Other things that we do use, yes, we do use mark schemes. I couldn't use an AQA one on here, obviously, because that would be publishing. But one of the things that we do quite like to do is break down the mark scheme alongside a model answer just before we send them into it and also give them a structure shift, which you can see on the side here, which just helps them reflect back on what are some of the things that they were picking up from the model answers. So using those as much as possible. Uh, the final thing I wanted to go through was um, how we can actually model our answers as much as possible as teachers. Um, so in terms of the uh, focus lesson and model uh, modeling instruction, that's the I do, as you can see per the gradual release model. Then sharing instruction about how do we do it together, and then uh, kind of you doing it as a bit of guided practice, and then trying to get into that independence. And that ties very nicely into Rosen Shine principles of modeling, um, something that I personally am a really big fan of, and also it helps build that confidence because students don't feel like they're going in on their own, they feel like they're being guided into it, um, and yet still they are gradually build into that independent practice rather than just going straight into independent practice. So the final thing I just wanted to go through is whilst they are doing that work or even whilst they're doing the questions at the beginning of the lesson, I feel like these are really powerful tools for building that self-esteem, building that confidence and making sure that students are engaged with their learning as much as possible. Um, these are visualizers in case if some of you haven't seen them before. Um, some people use them, um, I feel very strongly in terms of putting work underneath them and live marking it to demonstrate where students potentially could improve their work and I think that's a very strong way to do it. Another way that I've personally been trying to do more and I've run a session on this in my school and so a few teachers have taken it up as well is rewarding positive behaviours and rewarding positive work as well. So if you've identified a student who potentially is less engaged and you see they're doing really really well on a particular piece of work this also is a really strong potential way to solidify that strength, that confidence that they are building on that particular piece of work and then the next lessons and building on and building on from there, that builds that confidence, that helps them realise that actually they can do this and they're coming into geography lessons feeling like, yes, we can achieve. So there's just a few of the strategies that I've used this year. There are several others out there. Um, these are not exhaustive at all. Um, there's just a few things just to get you thinking about how we can make sure that we re-engage learners who potentially might have come disengaged for whatever reason. Thank you. Fantastic, Simon. Thank you very much for that. And some really timely advice um, at, at the end there as well. Um, we're just at the end. Yes, as some of you noticed in the YouTube feed, the beer delivery has arrived. Um, here it is. Um, and traditionally, there's a beer meet after this. Obviously, we are keeping our distance and not doing that at the moment. Um, thank you so much for coming along. Thank you so much um, for listening and for uh, engaging. Massive thank you again to the GA, uh, the GA and especially um, Harriet and her team have really pulled this together. Um, and, uh, you know, the last um, two days have been fantastic and there's another day tomorrow to come. Uh, Discover the World, thank you for your support right the way from 2015. You've been sponsoring this event um, and thank you again for stepping up for this one. Um, for the storytellers, absolutely amazing. It was impossible to um, whittle you down or select you, so you got all 14. And as I said, we will be uh, putting this up uh, on my channel. Uh, this will be there and free to watch. And also um, in the links there, I'll put um, a Google Drive folder with all the originals plus some links to the original looms uh, but do reach out to these speakers I, I hope you agree it's been a broad range from NQTs from five-year-olds uh, and everything in between uh, and mostly thank you to you the enthusiastic lurkers without you uh, teach meets um, are pointless I know it can feel like a fire hose of information going towards you but just sit back think um, we've got a little bit of time coming up and some of these ideas that you can implement, I've certainly seen quite a lot that are going to help me uh, next week when I'm thinking about how I'm going to be using that certain um, tech tool. And I've been very careful not to give any bingo words out here uh, next time. So thank you very much. Um, we've got to go now and pay attention to our dog Triven, who is uh, been eating a curry. Um, and that's what happens when Leah um, prioritises my beer, our beer over um over the dog thank you very much huge 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 thank you um and we hope that we'll see you again soon face to face next year and perhaps um we'll also live stream this up if you'd like us to to put together a live stream richard alloway has been brilliant in um in doing that in the past and um, we shall try and do that in the future and perhaps uh, part of the GA conference moving forward will be this style of virtual teach me who knows anyway thank you um and uh goodbye it seems uh
that's the end. Um, cheers all.